Good afternoon, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. This is a training that's provided by NASCAST as part of the Weatherization Plus Health Initiative. This afternoon's webinar, Best Practices for Forming Successful Collaborations, will be presented by Ryan Ward, Research Analyst for NASCAST, and a host of panelists that Ryan will later introduce. Before we begin, I'd just like to share the information for the format of this webinar. All attendees are on mute. You will have the capability to ask questions during the webinar using the chat option in the webinar toolbar. We do ask if you have a question that you would send your questions to the organizer using that feature. At the end of each panelist's presentation, we will break so that our presenters can respond to your questions. In order for us to stay on schedule, if we don't have time for all of your questions, we will respond by a follow-up email. There will be a link provided to the PowerPoints as well as the recorded webinar following the webinar. At this time, I'm going to turn over things over to Ryan Ward, Research Analyst for NASCASP. Thanks, Raymond. Um, I want to first uh, thank everybody for joining this webinar today. Um, this webinar will feature five distinguished panelists representing agencies in four regions across the country. Uh, three of our panelists represent two community action agencies with weatherization programs. Uh, one panelist represents a utility-run weatherization program. And our final panelist represents a DOE-certified weatherization training center. All of these panelists have had experience in working to find ways in which weatherization can collaborate with state and local partners to make homes healthier and safer when possible, while ensuring that the goals of energy efficiency are met. Uh, with their presentations, we hope that you'll be able to come away with ideas for potential collaborative efforts in your states and communities. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first panelist, Lorena Shaw from the Opportunity Council in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, Lorena has been involved in low-income energy assistance, con conservation education, and weatherization since 2004. She earned her master's degree from the University of Essex, England. Since returning to the Opportunity Council in 2009, Lorena has been active in developing the agency's Healthy Homes program along with several other agency initiatives. Lorena is currently the Community Services Manager for the Opportunity Council. So I'll hand it over to Lorena now. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everybody That's from the West Coast. And good afternoon to all of you on the other side of noon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about forming collaborations and partnerships within your own community action agency. So just a little, I think most of you are probably from community action agencies, but just to look at the broader picture, so there are approximately 1,000 community action agencies nationwide. We have 39 here in uh, Washington State. Opportunity, is, uh, Opportunity Council is the community action agency serving homeless and low-income families in Whatcom Island and San Juan counties, which is in the upper northwest corner of Washington State. We here, we have about 175 full and part-time employees serving over 18,000 people each year across a broad range of programs. Cool thing about CAPS is they're all a little bit different. They're community-driven with local priorities. <clears throat> So Washington State is a state that distributes their LIHEAP through community action agencies primarily. And then many of those community action agencies also have the weatherization program. So at the state level, both LIHEAP and weatherization, lead hazard reduction, are all distributed through the same office, the Department of Commerce, as well as homeless housing grants. And the state also holds joint conferences for LIHEAP and weatherization. So there's this natural partnership at the state level as well. So this is just a little overview of how our, um, our organization is set up. We have a community services department, our home improvement department, and our early learning and family services department, all working in conjunction with each other. But some of the key program players in our partnership, and specifically our partnership around Healthy Homes and Weatherization Plus Health. So in the Community Services Department, which is a broad department, that houses our Healthy Homes, our Conservation Education, Energy Assistance, and Homeless Housing programs. Our Home Improvement Department houses Weatherization, Weatherization Plus Health, our Home Rehab, and also our Training Center, the Building Performance Center. So then we have our Early Learning and Family Services Department and our primary partners up there are Head Start, Early Head Start, and ECAP, which is the state Head Start. 
and also the early support for infant and toddlers, the EFIT program. The Home Improvement Department, that used to be two departments. It was split between weatherization and rehab and the Building Performance Center. During the RA years, we split it up and have since brought it back together, which I think has tightened that partnership. Of course, ELAPS, our Early Learning and Family Services, is you know, focused on, on children and families. And we're just getting started working with the Early Support Program. So referrals for our program. So that's what I kind of primarily want to focus on today is how we have streamlined our referral process for weatherization plus health and healthy homes. So sort of all roads lead to energy assistance when we're talking referrals. So we try to route all intake through energy. We're able to offer targeted scheduling opportunities to Head Start families at their yearly orientations. This is a great opportunity to connect with Head Start. So with uh, weatherization guidelines and LIHEAP targeting, um, we're able to target those families because they're five, you know, they have children five and under. So that's a really nice uh, streamlining of programs where we know that they are a target group for both uh, weatherization and LIHEAP those families that are in Head Start. So in addition, at those orientation, Head Start families fill out a housing information questionnaire that is geared towards identifying families for weatherization, rehab, lead, healthy homes, and energy assistance. This is an important tool also when families do not take advantage of early scheduling, because we can accept that form anytime a new family enrolls throughout the year. So often those float down to me. We do a screening, figure out what programs they'd be eligible for, and reach out to them. So if, if a Head Start family is qualified for a program, we are prioritized and we contact them. Um, and we're able to do this because we've instituted an agency-wide consent agreement. Parents may opt out of it, but it's an assumed, basically an assumed consent when you, when you join one of our programs, whether it's energy assistance or Head Start. And this has been, this is one of the major barriers that we had to overcome when we wanted to partner with Head Start was getting around them sharing information with us and family names and things like that. So oh, this took many years of you know, conversations to get that in place. But now uh, when families join uh, Head Start, there is an informed consent piece that goes along with this, stating that their names may be shared with other programs that they may be eligible for. We, we are still working on. What we would like to do with Head Start is be, they have a health coordinator, and we know there's children with asthma in Head Start. They're not yet able to share that specific list with us, so we are still trying to work on how we can overcome HIPAA requirements in order to get that list. So we also, other routes are we also make appointments at their fall harvest dinner for those families that we miss during orientation. Um, and then other major referral routes include referrals from homeless housing case managers, our community resource center, which is a drop-in center where clients receive information and referral to agency and community services. Of course, self-referral from word of mouth and physician referral. Physician referral is a referral route we would really like to grow. We are currently investigating further opportunities in the healthcare field. So this is just a basic program flow. <clears throat> so most families are referred to energy assistance, and ener <clears throat> excuse me, an energy assistance eligibility appointment is conducted with an intake specialist determining eligibility for various programs. All energy assistance applicants are automatically income eligible for weatherization as the guidelines for weatherization surpasses energy assistance guidelines. And weatherization, healthy homes, weatherization plus health does not require a separate application when it is a referral from energy assistance. This is set forth in the State Department of Commerce's guidelines. A referral to them to the appropriate program is made. So how we do it is um, our weatherization file goes to our con conservation ed lead for scheduling. We do a first home visit, which is a, in speaking of weatherization plus health, the first home visit is a combination healthy homes and conservation education and weatherization pre-assessment conducted by conservation education um, program coordinator. The emphasis is on educating the family about potential asthma triggers in the home. An action plan and pledge is drawn up and supplies are given to the family to help control asthma triggers. Supplies include HEPAVAX, walk-off mats, mattress box spring and pillow covers, and green cleaning kits. 
So initial report detailing potential weatherization and weatherization plus health upgrades is then passed to the weatherization project coordinator. Action plan and pledge information put, is put in a report to the Head Start teacher if that's applicable, so that the Head Start teacher can help support the family in making those changes. The full assessment is then cover, is conducted by our project coordinator and the scope of work is drawn up. So following completion of the work, the work is inspected by quality assurance inspector and corrections are made as needed. Um, we do follow-up with the family uh, six months later for the healthy homes portion, and we do that via telephone. And then we do a weatherization follow-up, including uh, redoing energy calcs, and we do that either via a postcard or a phone uh, call. And that's done it one year later. So kind of who's in the mix here as far as personnel is we've got the department directors, the program managers, and that's primarily weatherization program managers and myself, and I manage the energy assistance program in addition to some other programs. Then we have our conservation healthy homes coordinator and lead, and then project coordinators, the quality uh, assurance, excuse me, <laughs> inspectors, um, early learning family services coordinator, and the early learning health coordinator. And our key periodic interactions that we have within those groups are a series of different meetings that we have. So the first one is our No Orphans meetings. This is probably the most important. So No Orphans is the venue for ensuring that all open weatherization or weatherization plus health clients are moving forward with their project. It is also time to discuss program changes. What is open for referrals? What programs are closing? What are the gaps in referrals? The information gained from this meeting is used to determine what referral pipelines to open and close in energy assistance. The other important meeting is our monthly or bimonthly Con Ed meeting. So this meeting is the venue to discuss program out, outreach plans, technical questions from Con Ed staff, and items specific to Con Ed visits. And we have the energy services meeting is a combination of, of all the energy assistance staff and the Con Ed staff, and sometimes some weatherization staff. And this is where we discuss what the referral needs are, um, <clears throat> and looking at um, what, what's open, what's not, and what constitutes a good referral. So we do a lot of education in these, um, in these meetings. And then, of course, there's periodic leadership meetings that take place to look at the big picture of the programs, and this is specifically weatherization plus health programs, and identify gaps in services and opportunities for new or better internal and external partnerships, and also to discuss training needs of staff. Right. So some of the other ways we engage um, the different program players and different partners is in Head Start, we've developed a, um, a training, a Healthy Homes Basics and Referrals training. We developed this in-house. And we present that as an in-service training to Head Start uh, teachers at the beginning of their school year. We've also done um, a green cleaning parenting class. So we take about an hour and teach parents how to clean green, and they are left with a uh, a small green cleaning kit, and these have been really popular and a great way to raise awareness within uh, the client community. And then also ongoing engagement with the Family Services Coordinator and Health Coordinator, and I specifically um, keep those partnerships going. And then with the Building Performance Center, they are BPI certified training, DOE certified, well, they may not be DOE yet, but we do um, all the training for Washington State. They also do lead safe training and deliver the National Center for Healthy Housing, um, Healthy Homes Training Institute uh, courses as well. And then with our homeless housing, um, we also deliver the Healthy Homes Basics and Referrals. We do a short lead hazard basics. Um, part of the requirements for some of the, the homeless housing programs is to do a lead inspection. And then also we do the green cleaning house a class excuse me, for other housing participants. So some of the barriers to engagement that we have had to overcome. Obviously, there's numerous programs. It's difficult scheduling meetings with all of the players. And we do have the multiple eligibility guideline issue, as I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, in early learning, we um, found, obviously, there's multiple priorities to address with limited resources. Uh, our first, when we first received Healthy Homes funding, our first instinct was to have the education delivered by the teachers and the home visitors in Head Start. And this proved to be impossible as they're just, they're, 
it's not that they weren't interested, but it's that their time is so limited that they have to address so many things on their home visits that doing a full Healthy Homes education visit was not feasible. Um, the HIPAA that I spoke of earlier has also been, um, that's kind of our most recent barrier, that now that we were able to get sort of a general list of families and to engage them better, we now want that list of asthma, you know, kids with asthma, and that's sort of our next hurdle to jump. Um, early learning, uh, we found, is you know, very tightly regulated by the feds, and that's been difficulty. That's been difficult in opening doors sometimes. With homeless housing, they also have very tight home visit agendas, and oftentimes families are in crisis. So ways that, ways that we've been able to overcome so, some of those barriers. So we've really focused on making, we've focused on making good referrals. We wanted to educate a wide range of home visitors. We've done this with our agency and also with partner agencies. Um, we had an indoor air quality grant a couple of years ago, and that allowed us to develop the Healthy Homes Basics and Referrals, and we delivered that to home visitors across the county. And we, that was a way to build awareness. Um, and also the other part is we wanted to streamline eligibility as much as we could. And we were able to do that with Healthy Homes. Um, healthy Homes here in, in, at the Opportunity Council is privately funded. And if you're eligible for an agency program, you're eligible for Healthy Homes at the least. If we want to continue to do weatherization plus health, you know, then we'll bring in through energy assistance and uh, you know, go that route or do a weatherization only application. And the other thing we've done is sort of we've worked the funding. You know, we look for opportunities to use existing funds in creative ways you know, while adhering to program guidelines. We mingle funds where it's appropriate. Um, our weatherization project coordinators look for ways to maximize the health and safety doctor <clears throat> dollars in the weatherization program. And you know, that can be used sometimes to address some healthy homes measures. Um, you know, ventilation measures are definitely covered um, through weatherization funding. And then also you know, the health opportunities and energy audits training, um, that, really, that training really expands on these opportunities that are you know, lower cost measures that can be done using weatherization dollars. And that is it for me. I thank you very much for your time. And I will turn that back over to Ryan for now. Thanks, Lorena. It doesn't look like there are any questions as yet, and so we can just keep going. Okay, uh, Raymond, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Marissa Westbrook, who is our next presenter uh, from the United Illuminating Company based out of New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Marissa Westbrook is the manager of residential energy services at the UIL Holdings Corporation and an electricity and natural gas utility serving customers in Connecticut and Western Massachusetts. Marissa works in the conservation and load management department, managing a team of individuals who administer the Connecticut residential energy efficiency programs offered as part of the Energy Efficiency Fund and Energize Connecticut initiative. Marissa has been with UIL for five years. Prior to working at UIL, she worked for Veolia Environmental Services outside of Boston. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Boston College and an MBA from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Marissa. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Can everybody, well, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm a, a manager of the Residential Energy Services Program. Uh, here at United Illuminating, and what we do here in Connecticut um, may be a little bit different than in some other states. Uh, the utilities, the two electric utilities, actually administer the energy efficiency programs uh, underneath or through the Energy Efficiency Fund in Connecticut. So we play a very active role in developing and administering those programs throughout the state. And today what I'm going to be talking uh, to everybody about is essentially examples of two successful uh, partnerships or programs that really highlight our partnerships, how they intersect with uh, weatherization as well as healthy homes. So with that, uh, the two programs I'm really going to focus on are is a Department of Energy grant that we administer called the Connecticut Efficient and Healthy Homes Initiative, and also in conjunction with that, uh, our Home Energy Solutions Income Eligible Program 
and the partnership that we have with that program and the WAP program. So those are really the two major partnership-related programs I'm going to be discussing today. So the United Eliminating Company, uh, the electric, one of two U electric utilities in Connecticut, uh, in partnership with the other utility, which is Connecticut Light and Power, was awarded a $3 million DOE grant. Uh, and this is called our Healthy Homes, we call it our Healthy Homes Initiative, the Connecticut Efficient and Healthy Homes Initiative. Uh, the grant is leveraged by our Energy Efficiency Fund program, uh, one of them, which is the Home Energy Solutions Income Eligible Program, uh, through the Energy Efficiency Fund. The purpose of the grant is to enable us to essentially address health and safety issues which prevent homes from being weatherized. Uh, so we really wanted to create a sustainable and holistic model for addressing these health and safety concerns that essentially will help us turn what would typically be deferrals uh, away from weatherization into referrals for weatherization because we can also address the health issues in the home at the same time. So the weatherization program and the HHI program in particular is leveraged, as I mentioned, through the Home Energy Solutions Income Eligible, that's H-E-S-I-E. Uh, this is one of our, this is our income eligible weatherization program, and it essentially allows vendors to reach uh, thousands of homes every year to provide energy efficiency upgrades at minimal, uh, little to no cost for, for most participants. While in the home, the weatherization vendors have an opportunity to actually uh, look for and identify the health and safety hazards that exist that would otherwise prevent weatherization. So this particular program, uh, we have developed partnerships where we can address the health and safety concerns, but the vendors in a one-touch solution will actually perform both a weatherization and a health and safety audit uh, at the same time, and then we will work with partners to address those health and safety concerns. We use the DOE grant dollars to address the health and safety hazards, while we use the uh, energy efficiency funds to fund the energy efficiency improvements that would otherwise be incorporated into the weatherization program. So we're leveraging different sources of funding for a holistic approach in the home. So this just shows here uh, the HES IE program plus health and safety uh, is essentially our Connecticut Efficient and Healthy Homes Initiative. Again, this is a one-touch system for referrals, uh, integrating a streamlined approach, uh, utilizing a shared Healthy Homes Assessment tool, and providing a systemized referral and education process. So when our, when our vendors are doing the weatherization and Healthy Homes initial assessment, they're also providing education to the customers at the same time. In addition, we're coordinating the funding sources from multiple entities to address all of the energy and health and safety concerns. Uh, and I should note, in terms of the health and safety measures uh, that prevent weatherization that we are looking at, uh, that would be anything from carbon monoxide to mold, uh, asbestos, lead, uh, and the partners that we work with to address this are cities, low-income re uh, revitalization loan entities, uh, lead abatement agencies. So those are the partner networks that we've formed in this process. In the Healthy Homes program, we have an initial intervention, which consists of a direct install of measures performed in the home as part of the initial weatherization and healthy homes uh, assessment. We actually direct install measures right in that initial visit. The energy health and safety audit that's performed, and the customer education that's provided at this time uh, to help them reduce energy and also address health and safety. One of the key features of this program is our partner collaboration, and that's how we're able to make all of these uh, pieces uh, gel together. So the partner collaboration uh, through a one-touch system, uh, we're able to either fix, refer, or educate and provide access to multiple services at one time. 
enabling us uh, with the ultimate goal of changing these deferrals to referrals. I just wanted to point out an example of a project under the Healthy Homes Initiative uh, that highlights how we've been able to collaborate with various partners uh, to affect both the energy piece as well as the Healthy Homes component. And this example is in West Haven, Connecticut. And under the Efficient Healthy Homes program, we partnered with an organization called LAMP. Uh, LAMP stands for Lead Action for Medicaid Primary Prevention. And it's an, uh, an organization run out of the Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Uh, and they essentially focus on lead remediation uh, and other types of health and safety remediation work. Uh, as part of the project, LAMP completed a $37,000 lead remediation portion to make the home lead safe. And they did this through liquid encapsulation of the paint both inside and outside of the home and also replaced the windows and the doors. The uh, this Healthy Homes Initiative uh, contributed $12,000 in energy efficiency, health, and safety measures. And that $12,000 is actually a combination of DOE grant money plus the leveraged energy efficiency fund income eligible money. Uh, to address, again, both the energy efficiency and health and safety concerns. Uh, some of the measures that were addressed included energy efficient lighting, a furnace tune-up, air sealing, insulation, appliance, replacement, ventilation, uh, and carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. Uh, carbon monoxide detection and, uh, I'm sorry, carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors. Sorry about that. Uh, in addition, LAMP will perform uh, some additional future mold abatement that uh, is estimated to be about ten thousand dollars. That's uh, actually, I believe, uh, in progress or soon to soon to happen. Uh, there was also wall and ceiling material that was removed uh, because it had been water damaged. There was replacement of uh, with mold resistant material and the installation of measures to redirect water intrusion, uh, as well as additional safety items and electrical upgrades. So in summary, $62,000 was pulled together to address multiple issues in one home. Uh, in our traditional energy efficiency programs, this would have been an actual deferral. We would not have been able to service this home. But by collaborating with LAMP, we were able to achieve an annual uh, reduction of over 12,000 kilowatt, I'm sorry, 12, uh, 1,200 kilowatt hours and almost 900 uh, CCF in gas savings while making the home uh, more safe. The second partnership I wanted to highlight is the way that our utility partnerships with the WAP program here in Connecticut. So Connecticut's WAP program is administered by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. We call that DEEP here in Connecticut. DEEP partners with the statewide community action network to provide services to eligible residents throughout the state. In order to maximize federal funding for the WAC program, uh, the community action agencies partner with the utilities. Uh, so we essentially, as the utilities and through the Energy Efficiency Fund program, in particular our Income Eligible Home Energy Solutions Program, we're providing extra funding for energy efficiency measures. This therefore allows the WAP agencies to essentially spread their federal funding further. Um, they can use less of their money because it's offset by the Energy Efficiency Fund money, and their, their money then stretches further. The purpose of these, uh, the utility partnerships in Connecticut are to benefit the mutual customers that we, sh we have, the utilities and the WAP, uh, WAP program customers. By providing leveraged funding, uh, the community action agencies administering the WAP program allow more customers uh, to be served with more and greater services. The partnership uh, with the CAAs go beyond the WAP program and allow us to provide weatherization uh, and other programs through our energy efficiency programs. Uh, 
Uh, in summary, the utility companies in Connecticut have been partnering with the community action agencies uh, in, under the WAP program in order to leverage state and federal weatherization funds. Uh, leveraging the weatherization money allows more customers to receive more comprehensive services. The CTE HHI, the Healthy Homes Program, separate from the WAP program, has allowed us to further develop partnerships with various organizations throughout the state to address the health and the safety issues uh, within the home that otherwise uh, would have been deferred from our regular weatherization program. And by partnering with these multiple agencies throughout the state, we are really able to provide a one-touch, holistic approach uh, to servicing customers so there are not multiple agencies uh, having to go into the home to provide services. Uh, this slide actually shows my contact information as well as one of my team members who uh, adm administers and runs this program. His name is Aaron uh, Evan Saraton, and he was not able to be on this call today, but he is essentially the, the healthy homes expert in our team and has worked very closely on this program uh, for the last several months. So that is all I have. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thanks, Marissa. We do have a few questions. Um, sure. are, are copies of the assessment tools that these agencies are using available? We have a few. Uh, we utilize a DOE audit tool called MEET, um, and it's actually an electronic database tool. Uh, I believe it is a, a DOE tool. That is our main tool that we use. We also have a Healthy Homes checkup form, which I don't know off the top of my head if that is available. I will check with Evan on the availability of the Healthy Homes checkup form. Okay, we can but follow the, up on that. Yes, I'll make a note to follow up on that. But I do believe the audit tool, which is called NEAT, N-E-A-T, is a DOE audit tool. Okay, great. And that leads into our next question. Um, does the NEAT audit tool take into account the additional health concerns? I believe it does, but I will also note that question and check up on that. Um, so does the NEAT tool take into consideration the health and safety aspect? Yes. Okay. And you know what, I do not, I, I actually, I'm going to say I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, so I will look into that. Okay. Um, and then the next question, approximately how many housing units are assisted per year? Under the HHI program, um, the Healthy Homes Initiative program, this is a, a three-year grant. The grant was awarded, uh, actually we're in the last six months of the grant. It ends in September of this year. So this will be year three. Our result in particular uh, for the state of Connecticut for administering this grant throughout the state uh, again, it's a, it's a grant program. This is the first time we've done anything like this, and the utility has, you know, spearheaded anything like this. We are on track within the grant period of three years to complete roughly 800 units. Um, so that's been a three-year process for the three-year grant. I would also state that a, a significant amount of that three-year period uh, involved building those partnerships. So. I would say a lot of the active work that's gone into the weatherization and health initiatives probably has occurred within the last year and a half, I would, I would estimate. So it's been a three-year grant, but the most active part of that has been the last year and a half. And all I can speak to is that through the duration of the grant, we are targeted to complete about 800 units. So again, this is a pilot. I don't have much more data than that right now. It's, I shouldn't say it's a pilot. It's a grant. Um, and so that's just the data that we have right now. It's, as of what's available. Okay, thanks, Marissa. Um, right. Ryan, we're going to hand it back over to you. Okay, thanks, Raymond. Uh, next up, we have two panelists uh, from Cooley Cap Incorporated, a uh, community action agency located in Westby, Wisconsin. Our first panelist from Cooley Cap is Kaya Fox. Uh, Kaya Fox is the Housing Assistant Director for Cooley Cap Inc. Kaya works with a variety of housing and community development programs at Cooley Cap, including housing rehabilitation, home purchase, weatherization, housing counseling, flood assistance, land trust housing, and new housing construction. Working extensively with low-income families, Kaya has a very strong commitment and understanding of the individuals served at Cooley Cap. 
With an extensive background in public relations, Kaya brings a strong voice to the Cooley Cap housing program. She is also a certified housing counselor, housing quality standards inspector, and home certified specialist. Uh, our second panelist from Cooley Cap is Derek Schroeder. Uh, Derek started in the weatherization field in 2006 as a weatherization crew member. Since 2006, he has moved up through the ranks at Cooley Cap from crew member, crew leader, energy auditor, now the lead energy auditor and local training officer for Cooley Cap. Derek enjoys the constant chance to always learn more in regards to building science. Derek enjoys the client interaction and the chance to make a difference for each household that he and Cooley Cap comes across. Derek, in collaboration with Cooley Cap's community development department, has been a part of collaborating WAP funds with other or with several other funding sources to maximize the energy efficiency and health and safety for the client Cooley Cap serves. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kaya and Derek. Thank you, Ryan. Just making sh So we're going to talk today about some programs that Cooley Cap has been operating for quite some years now that incorporates our weatherization, our home rehabilitation, and then our local Habitat for Humanity affiliate um, and trying to address the needs of the home and moving weatherization homes off of the deferral list so that they can receive assistance. So we're going to kind of talk about it as a um, real life scenario situation and how you can, from start to finish, take a look at a possible program in the same manner. Because a lot of agencies do run weatherization programs and also have within that agency um, some type of rehabilitation program, or they know of other local agencies that also run rehabilitation programs that they can start working together um, from start to finish on how you can identify these projects. And we take a look at these projects in two directions. We take a look at a client who is qualified for weatherization and for some reason or another um, their home must be deferred due to uh, rehabilitation needs in the home. And then we also talk about how we can extend our rehabilitation dollars by taking a look at a client who comes in through our rehabilitation programs but can also benefit um, from our free weatherization program that we have here in Wisconsin. So kind of the real life scenario, if you were going to do this, we always take a look at identifying the needs of the family at the initial intake. We actually have a hybrid case manager position and she kind of sits on the fence between our rehabilitation and our weatherization programs. And so she intakes all of the phone calls uh, from clients who are looking for assistance, whether it be you know, our weatherization programs, you know, I'm looking for some, you know, insulation or my furnace needs some work, to clients who are calling about rehabilitation, um, so I need a roof, so I need new windows. And so she goes through a, a triage form that kind of takes a look at a holistic approach um, to the needs of the client and then takes that information and uses that to then identify which programs would best serve that client. Um, we have a variety of rehabilitation programs here at Cooley Cap that um, address a, a wide variety of different needs in the household from the big to the small. And so then she will work with that client from the very beginning to move them through the process and get them through um, to the programs that they need to be part of. Um, her position as kind of that triage case manager is mostly funded through our HUD counseling dollars that we receive each year. So we usually take a look at um, two options when we're uh, inspecting a home. Is We either do the inspection together, so Derek and I will actually go out to the house together um, and do an initial home inspection and an energy audit at the same time. Um, this is usually the one that works best, but you know, as we all know, we're all very busy and sometimes timing doesn't work, and so sometimes the both of us being able to take that kind of time out of our day to go out to a house doesn't work. Um, and so then a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just communicate back and forth either via email um, or the phone uh, as far as what are the client needs. Um, I'll talk to you about some of the stuff, uh, let Derek talk to you about some of the stuff that weatherization does in homes. So the first step of weatherization is always having an energy audit done. And basically what an energy audit is, we go into the home and we're seeing how that home is operating energy wise. Uh, we pretty much go over every square inch of the home. Uh, we do full diagnostic testing on the heating system, uh, checking out CO levels, uh, checking out airflow, 
uh, efficiency. We look at the water heater system. We're making sure if it's a naturally drafting water heater, if it has a negative draft that meets the specifications that the state of Wisconsin has put in place. Um, and then also other parts of that as well, too, is if they have like uh, gas cook stoves, uh, we're checking the CO levels that it's emitting into the home because in a sense a gas cook stove is just an unvented space heater inside of the kitchen. Um, also with doing that we're looking at the insulation levels throughout the home, um, doing blower door testing on the home, seeing how leaky it is. If there's attached garages we're doing uh, what's called zone pressure testing and we're just making sure that there's not a direct connection between the garage and the home so if a vehicle were to be left running or also due to the chemicals that a lot of people store in their garages that there's, uh, we're trying to minimize the chance for any of that air to come in from the garage inside the home. Um, all of the items are then ran through uh, the, the same tool that uh, the, the last speaker uses. It's NEAT, the National Energy Audit Tool. Um, all of the mobile homes that we serve are modeled through MIA, which is the Mobile Home Energy Audit. And it takes all of the variables that we collect on our energy audit and we enter it in and it co compiles the list of what's the most cost effective measures to do on the home. Um, and it kind of, for the whole job, it, it assigns a number which is called a SIR or savings to investment ratio. And that number has to be one or higher for the entire job. And what the one stands for is for every dollar that is invested into the home, there's a dollar payback. So obviously the higher that we can get that above one, the faster that the job pays itself off. If it's below one, and uh, that means that there's not a payback on it. So what we run into a lot of times, especially with the housing stock seeming to be changing a little bit, uh, we're coming in on a lot of newer homes, newer ranch homes, where they may already have uh, some energy efficient appliances in there, like a newer furnace, maybe a newer refrigerator. Uh, there's some insulation that could be brought up a little bit, but there's not enough energy saving measures uh, to do on the home that could support the cost of, let's say, a non-drafting water heater. Um, so the home at that point in time, we will model ahead of time in that the energy modeling tool to see if it could support the cost of a water heater replacement that's non-drafting. If it does not support the cost, that's when a lot of times we'll collaborate with Kaya's program and they can come in and replace that non-drafting water heater that weatherization dollars can't support and we can uh, move ahead on weatherization as well as uh, with Kaya's program. Other items too that we run into is lots of health and safety items. Uh, we do help out a fair amount of people with disabilities if there's access issues that weatherization dollars are not allowed to be used on, for example, handicap ramps, um, shower accessibility, all items that when we're in the home, uh, they may not have had a chance to have anyone else in that home to look at it. We can submit those to Kaya and she can use them as well too for accessibility issues. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a really great combination of programs and, and what Derek has said in the past is with our energy auditors going into homes, we go into, when you talk about the number of homes that are deferred, probably 400 to 450 homes per year just through our weatherization programs. And these are homes that I'm not getting into, that our rehabilitation staff aren't getting into. So they get a first look in these homes and can kind of assess some of the needs of the um, different homeowners and come back to us through the rehabilitation program to let us know of some needs in the household. So this is, we're talking right now about how we can kind of go from rehab to weatherization. And what I always say is that with our clients, we rarely ever pay for a furnace with our rehabilitation dollars. So if I go into a home and I determine that there's some furnace needs or ductwork needs, um, insulation needs, I don't include that um, typically in my rehabilitation funds. Those are then turned over to our rehabilitation programs to take care of those items. What we have in the state of Wisconsin is the threshold for qualification for weatherization is 60% of the state median income. And most of my rehabilitation programs are 80% of the county median income. And they are almost identical. Um, so pretty much anybody who is eligible for energy assistance and weatherization is also eligible for our rehabilitation program. So usually what we do when we're actually doing the work, and I recommend this for anybody, is always do the rehabilitation first, regardless if you're, as you're doing a rehabilitation client to weatherization or a weatherization client into rehabilitation. It's so much easier to get that rehabilitation work out of the way first um, because some of the rehab may be dependent, or some of the weatherization work may be dependent on the rehab work that you're doing. And then 
I think the other important thing to never lose track of is that whole communication system back and forth. So you can be moving along with a project, you know, getting all the work done, you close out the file, and then have some type of system to make sure that you're letting your weatherization staff know that the work is done, it's completed, and they can move forward with their process. Because sometimes those things, small little steps can get missed. Um, the next step we have is our weatherization to rehab. So we have a home that's been identified by the auditors that needs some rehab. Um, some of the common things that we see with our programs is, for example, we've got a leaking roof. Um, we have attic insulation that we need to put in, and if we have a roof that's leaking, we can't put in insulation and have it get wet or molded. Um, Derek was talking quite a bit about our hot water heaters, uh, water heaters that are venting properly. If weatherization goes in and tightens up the home, that can be a very uh, health, very large health issue for the family. Um, electrical work, so for example, removing knob and tube wiring from an attic so that insulation can then be put over top. Um, larger places where air is leaking, so we've got open walls that need drywall so that they can put dense pack insulation in. And then what Derek was talking about as well, the lack of the savings to investment ratio. So there's just not enough money that weatherization can put in the more money that they're putting in is bringing down that savings ratio. So we can come in with some basically funds on our, hand, our, our end to kind of bring that one-to-one -one ratio up. Um, so if Derek can kind of talk a little bit now about how we go from an energy audit into uh, a rehabilitation project. Once we've identified an item in a home that weatherization dollars cannot address, either due, it, due to it not being an allowable measure for example, like the large areas. Uh, we can do small areas of drywall patch with weatherization dollars, but when we're talking about where someone's remodeling a second story or something like that, or a tenet, they've, roof that's uh, leaking quite bad, those are items that weatherization dollars are not allowed to be used for. So when we go in the home, we've identified what's wrong with the home. So when we get back, typically what we do is we will type up an email uh, identifying and explaining what needs to be taken care of the home uh, we will attach photos, uh, client information, so that that can be sent to Kaya. So when that information is sent to the contractor for bid, there's a lot of times that they can just base what we gave to them for information, and they can actually give us the bid without even being at the home if we're complete enough. Yep. Um, something that Kaya and I have been working on recently that we have not fully rolled out yet is we're just coming up with like a mini data collection form that uh, will identify things a lot easier and better so that when it is sent to the contractor, it will minimize the amount of times that someone has to go into the home. Instead of having three separate contractors go into home for a bid, we can give them, in a sense, this sheet that explains the square footages of everything, the exact issues that are wrong, and they could more than likely just su submit a bid to us without even, even coming to the home. I'll turn over to Kaya for this part here now. So then once uh, an auditor has been out to the home and has taken pictures and addressed the needs that need to be taken care of before weatherization can move forward, um, we work with the staff to begin the rehab project. And this is also when our Habitat for Humanity uh, local affiliate can come in as well. Um, they are working with us through their um, critical home repair program in which they have funds to do uh, repair projects using volunteer labor on homes. And so once we get a deferral from a weatherization auditor, we take a look at the needs of that home and decide whether it is something that we can do with our existing rehabilitation dollars or is this a uh, project that would be great for our Habitat volunteers. Um, you do have to remember when you're working with Habitat organizations that some of the more um, technical work or work that requires certification, um, a lot of times the volunteers aren't able to do that. But smaller jobs, um, where you know construction labor and just construction materials is what you need for the project. The Habitat volunteers are really great at working with that. Um, they actually, most of the Habitats who are working with the Critical Home Repair Program do have some funds um, as well that they can use for um, the repair project, so paying for materials um, and paying for possibly a general contractor's time to oversee the work. We actually have funding internally here at Cooley Cap that we use. Um, we usually use our smaller funding sources to address these. We work with the Affordable Housing Program, um, which is funds that are available through federal home loan banks across the nation. Every single federal home loan bank will have an affordable housing program. Um, and most of those affordable housing programs do have rehabilitation funds available. We also use USDA Rural Development Housing Preservation Grants, which are also funds that come from federal USDA 
um, to each of the states. Um, and again, when the project is complete, letting the weatherization staff know right away that the work has been done, because then they can start scheduling to get out and get the weatherization work done. Um, specifically, when we're talking about the affordable housing program, Cooley Cap, through the past couple years, has applied for and received what we call our AHP weatherization deferral funds. And these funds come from our local uh, Federal Home Loan Bank, which is located in Chicago. And what we do is we apply for funding specifically for projects that have been deferred for weatherization services. We have 30 projects that we will do over a 12-month period. We do an average of $8,000 per house in assistance. And this has been an extremely successful program um, for us over the past couple years. Uh, one of the really great things about the affordable housing program funds that we have here from the Chicago Federal Home Loan Bank is that the money is offered as five-year forgivable loans. Um, so the homeowners, as long as they stay in the home for five years after the work is completed, they don't repay any of those funds. And then the other great thing is that once we are done with our um, weatherization deferral work, so we've put the new roof on, we've drywalled the ceiling, um, we've replaced the water heater, weatherization can go in and because of the unique uh, situation here at the state of Wisconsin in which we not only have our federal DOE funds for weatherization dollars, we also have set aside public benefit dollars that come through our state. Um, so on average, we do between six to $8,000 worth of weatherization work on a home. So we can put in $8,000 worth of affordable housing programs and leverage that with $8,000 worth of weatherization funds as well. So this is a really great system and a really great program that allows a lot more of those healthy home needs to be completed in each of the individual homes that we go in. So this is one of the examples that we have. This was a program that went from weatherization to rehab. Um, and it was a project located in Hillsboro, Wisconsin. And this was kind of what we were taking a look at. And this is one of the uh, examples that we had in which we um, used some of our internal funding. So we had a leaking roof. We had an attached garage that uh, did not have drywall on the ceiling. Um, and due to the energy audit of the home, we needed to drywall the garage ceiling that so we could install um, insulation over the top. And then another thing that was not allowed through the uh, NEAT audit um, was the cost to replace the door from the garage to the basement. So it was very deteriorated um, and had, you know, needed to be replaced but was not supported with the weatherization NEAT system. So the cost of the total rehab that we did on the house was $4,295, and that was given to them as a forgivable loan through the affordable housing program. That was then leveraged with $5,296.75 in weatherization work. So the next uh, thing we're going to talk about specifically is how we work with our local habitat affiliate. Um, and that is the La Crosse area habitat that we have, which is really close to our offices here in Westby. Um, La Crosse is one of the larger cities in Wisconsin. And they have a fairly large habitat program. Um, habitat Critical Repair Program is actually a national program. Um, that was launched by Habitat a couple years ago um, and, is being, and is starting to be organized and launched by local Habitat affiliates. Um, so this is how Habitat does it. They select uh, partner families based on income, need, and the willingness to partner. Um, so they look at homeowners also who, just like with um, new construction homes, um, are willing to put some sweat equity into the work that's being done on their homes. Um, income requirements for Habitat programs are quite a bit lower than our weatherization and our rehab programs, they're typically looking at people who are under 50% of the county median income. Um, Habitat affiliates have really great connections with volunteers and local donated labor that take no profit for their services. So your cost for your rehabilitation can be extremely low. Um, so you know, this is something that you know, Habitat is typically known for building houses, but now they're moving into more of a critical repair program for existing housing. So I'm going to have Derek tell you about the client that we had with our Habitat programs. So this is a home that I energy audited um, probably right around a year and a half to two years ago. Uh, when I got to the home, it's a older, probably 1940s, 1950s, one-story home that had been added on to uh, with an attached garage and also kind of uh, a, a rather large living bedroom area kind of in the, in the back side of it. Uh, this home on a crawl space so when 
they added onto the home, they added a furnace in a furnace closet between the garage and the house inside of a heated um, hallway in a sense. So the furnace had been replaced when they remodeled, so it was a fairly efficient furnace. Uh, the water heater that they had was already fairly efficient as well. They had a newer refrigerator, so we have three items that were already kind of going against us on helping us uh, get more uh, savings on the home. The home did need attic insulation. When I was looking at the furnace, though, above the furnace cabinet, or the furnace closet, there was no ceiling ever installed, so I was looking directly at the roof sheeting. Um, so in the neat audit, I modeled the cost to pull the furnace out and install a ceiling above the furnace closet and also uh, various other things that needed to be completed. There was some electrical wiring uh, that was uh, needed some attention. After I added all of them costs, the high cost of that repair made even with adding the insulation not a cost-effective job anymore because it takes away from the savings. You're adding all of them costs to the neat audit and it just takes away from the savings. So I had taken a bunch of photos, gotten out some measurements, and this is uh, pictures that I actually sent to Kaya. So you can kind of tell here, uh, looking straight ahead, the first picture on the left is looking straight at the furnace closet. The picture right below the one on the left is looking up. And what you're actually looking at is the roof sheeting. And the picture on the top right is an outside wall where the air conditioner line runs in. And you can see where the wiring is just randomly put in. Uh, there was actually open wires. I don't know if you can see that on the photo or not. And then the picture on the bottom right um, actually is looking up, and that ductwork goes down the hallway, so it's above the ceiling, and then turns and goes into the main attic of the home, which was wide open to the attic. So that opening there was wide open to the main attic, allowing all of the heat to escape. All of the costs associated with trying to repair this made it a, a deferral in weatherization. So I was able to take these photos, get the information on the Kaya, and we were able to partner with the Habitat for Humanity, who at that point in time was targeting homes in that part of La Crosse. And afterwards, this is after pictures of what they did. So they had pulled the furnace through volunteers, uh, actually certified uh, HVAC company volunteers donated their time and the material for this. Um, they then sheetrocked the outside wall, they sheetrocked the ceiling, they used one part foam to seal up any gaps and whatnot and reinstall the furnace. And we were then able to move ahead and fully insulate the attic of this client's home. And uh, since weatherization, uh, the annual estimated energy savings, because her furnace and air, because it does get quite warm in La Crosse too, uh, when I was there during the summer, the air conditioner never actually turned off the entire time that we were there because of the lack of insulation in the attic and also due to the fact that there was really no ceiling above this furnace at all. Same goes for the winter. That furnace would run and run and run and never turn off because it was, in a sense, just heating the outdoors. Um, the first annual estimated savings that the client received was honestly around $1,500. They were spending to the point that they were going to sell their house because they could not afford to live in the home anymore. Um, since then, they have been so thrilled, they've, uh, they've drastically reduced their heating bills and are able to stay in the home now. And she actually, the homeowner, when she opened her first um, heating bill after we had done the weatherization work, had honestly thought about calling uh, the heating supplier to say, you know, what went wrong because my bill is way too low. Um, so it was, it was a drastic reduction in her bill. Um, so. The other thing that I will talk about, too, that's not in the slideshow is we're actually working with Habitat for Humanity in the La Crosse area right now on what we call the Renew Project. It's a neighborhood revitalization project that is targeting one of the poorest neighborhoods in the La Crosse area. And Cooley Cap Habitat for Humanity, the neighborhood groups, uh, local colleges, um, and the city are all working to, uh, together to identify homes in that neighborhood that need assistance. And so we're kind of doing a blitz attack on the homes during the month of May, where we'll be coming in with our rehabilitation dollars, Habitat will be coming home in with their critical repair dollars, um, and we'll be taking a look at all of the homes in that neighborhood and then addressing the individual needs. Um, so for example, Cooley Cat might come in and replace windows, Habitat will come in um, and replace the roof, um, and we're all working together to you know, take care of that neighborhood and start beautifying it. So this has actually received some national recognition uh, it's a fairly forward program, and we're really hoping to replicate it in other neighborhoods uh, in the La Crosse area. 
So some of the things that we've seen as the benefits of working together is, of course, why we're all here. It's a holistic approach to client services. Um, overall, we're saving money for homeowners. One of the things that is an unseen benefit that any of you who run rehabilitation programs, weatherization dollars can be match dollars. If you need match or leverage dollars for your rehabilitation programs, you can take a look at your weatherization funds for that. Um, you have your rehab dollars that can stretch farther, as we've all seen. Um, rehabilitation dollars are going down and down and down, so this allows you to help more people over the long term. Um, this allows deferrals of weatherization services to proceed. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, it allows six to $8,000 worth of energy savings to be put back into the home. Um, very nice kind of back scratching. You know, if I help you, you help me. It's allowed uh, really great relationships to form in our area. And honestly, those relationships that we've developed over the years help the Renew Project move forward uh, in the city of La Crosse because we've already been at the table together. Some of the things to watch out though for, if you're running rehabilitation programs, most of money from weatherization is federal funds. Um, so it can trigger lead rules if you're working with CDBG or home programs. Um, you do have to, like I said, you just cannot miss those little steps of communication to make sure that these projects are moving along slowly and you're talking together um, and making sure that you have those things fit into your program so that everybody knows what's going on. When you put rehab into it, especially with some of these federal programs that do require procurement um, and bidding with local contractors, the process can take longer. Um, and sometimes that can be hard for our homeowners. In Wisconsin, we have negative 40 degree weather a lot over the winter months. Um, so when homeowners are looking for weatherization assistance and we've got to kind of slow things down to get, weather, to get the rehab work done, it can be frustrating. Um, and then it can be extra time to coordinate, especially when you're dealing with uh, volunteers through the Habitat programs. Um, there is a lot of extra work that goes in to make sure that we've got everything uh, taken care of and that the volunteers are in place. So thank you so much for letting us talk to you today, and our contact information is there. Thanks, Derek and Taya. We do have one question, um, and that question is, how are habitat costs so much less than weatherization costs? Well, it, basically because they're working with volunteers. Uh, there's zero labor costs on any of the work that's being done. Um, and then also most of the local habitat affiliates also have really great connections with local suppliers for donated and discounted materials. So a lot of what they're doing when they're working on these homes is materials that they already have in place, materials that they can get donated. Um, and then, like I said, the, there's absolutely no labor costs whatsoever. OK, thanks. Um, we're going to hand it back over to Ryan, who's going to introduce our, our final panelist. Thanks, Raymond. Um, so our last panelist is Amanda Evans from the New Mexico Energy Training, uh, Energy Smart Training Academy, a DOE weatherization assistance program training center located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Amanda is the director of the Center of Excellence for Green Building and Energy Efficiency, as well as the New Mexico Energy Smart Academy at the Santa Fe Community College. She also teaches in both the credit and on-credit programs. Amanda is on the board of the Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association, USGBC New Mexico, Foundation for Building, National Energy Educators Institute, and is a member of the Department of Energy Weatherization Plus Committee and the Sustainable Santa Fe Commission. She is regularly invited to speak about energy efficiency, healthy homes, and green building training issues around the country, including most recently at the MIT Women in Clean Energy Symposium. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Amanda. Okay, so um, good afternoon or, or good morning, I guess, for some of you still. Um, I'm going to talk about how uh, we've collaborated, not just involving uh, weatherization, but many other entities we've worked with, um, which could be natural partners for weatherization, and, and then how we've integrated healthy homes training throughout all our classes. So as Ryan mentioned, I work at Santa Fe Community College in New Mexico, and we have a really diverse student body. We have from high school students up through people in the 70s and 80s, um, and our student body is almost half Hispanic. And even though most people think of Santa Fe as being a, a wealthy tourist town, we have really high levels of poverty uh, in some areas and also throughout the state. So our mix of students that come through here is, is really wide. And this is a photo of um, where, where I am. It's the Trades and Advanced Technologies Center. Um, and we do classes here from typical HVAC and plumbing, 
to solar and biofuels and all our weatherization and healthy homes classes. Um, and we don't just do degree programs. I mainly work in workforce development. And so we have people coming in for short workshops uh, to upgrade their skills. Um, and we train all the weatherization staff. And we train all around the state as well. So we're not just located up here in Santa Fe. So several years ago, we received a Department of Energy grant through the New Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority and uh, became one of the National Weatherization Training Centers. So this is a photo of the New Mexico Energy Smart Academy lab. And um, so behind, behind you, if you're looking at this photo, is where we have like a classroom set up. And so we can go from sort of a traditional classroom-based training and then turn around. There's a, a great lab space to work in. We've also got a full-size mobile home that's right outside our lab and that we integrate into whatever type of class we have. Um, in New Mexico, about 65% of our housing is mobile homes, so, so it's really important people understand issues specific to, to mobile homes. And so here are some of the partners that we work with um, in our training. We became the state partner for the National Center for Healthy Housing, and that's an organization that for 20 years has been dedicated to healthy homes and healthy home training. And it's funded through HUD and EPA, uh, CDC, and then a lot of different foundations. And we teach most of their courses, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. We're also the straight state training partner for the weatherization program. So we do all of the weatherization training for our state. Um, New Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority, we work very closely with them. Uh, this is the state organization that the DOE funds to deliver low-income weatherization. So we coordinate with them to make sure our training meets their needs. And another partner uh, or program we work with is ResNet. So we train HERS raters. And those are, uh, if you don't know, people who do energy efficiency analyses on homes um, in our city. We have a mandatory green code for new construction. And you can't build a house without hiring a HERS rater to work closely with. And and so, of course, HERS raters, because they're very involved with builders who are now building tight, efficient homes, they really need to understand principles of, of healthy homes. We are a BPI test center, and we do BPI training. That's the Building Performance Institute certification for energy analysis. And so, like HERS raters, they need very comprehensive understanding of healthy homes. And we have many weatherization people who've gone through both BPI and HERS training, as, as well as all the DOE training. And then lastly, we also are the state training partner for the Building Operator Certificate Program. And this is a program for commercial facility managers. And it teaches them how to effectively run commercial facilities for maximum energy efficiency. And so one of the day-long classes that they take is called um, Indoor Environmental Quality. And once again, many of the same uh, concepts of healthy homes are very relevant here. For example, we're talking about asthma issues, radon, moisture, ventilation, those types of things. We've also taught specific green cleaning classes for building maintenance people. So I've talked a bit about the partners. And now I'm, I'll talk a bit about the people that we train in more detail. So as I mentioned, we train people who do audits on buildings, from weatherization workers to HERS raters, BPI auditors, and facility operators. And, and all of these people really need to understand the implications of their work. Making buildings energy efficient is often seen as the focus of their work. And, and I think it's one thing that we do really well is we make the health aspect of what they're doing uh, one of the most important parts of the training. And in fact, sometimes I think we may do this a bit too successfully. Um, I had a colleague in the housing industry forward me on an email that he was sent recently that so one of my students had sent him. And I'm going to quote you what the student said. He said, are you requiring combustion testing and test out of your contractors for safety? Are you doing surveys for health and safety? As I have been brainwashed by Amanda Evans of Santa Fe Community College over the last couple of years to think that these issues are really important, we would like to help you with your repair program. <laughs> so so we, also, we also train um, contractors and architects and, and builders. And whenever they're going through classes here on new building codes or advanced framing techniques, there are always opportunities to, to brainwash them, I guess, about looking at the healthy home aspect of their work. Um, we've worked with the um, Department of Health. And that's been really fascinating, because we've learned a lot from them um, equally as we've uh, trained them. And they've learned about combustion, ventilation issues that I don't think they realized it in the same level. They didn't fully understand. 
Um, we train uh, with the Indian Pueblos and Tribes in New Mexico. And in fact, next week we are teaching two classes at Zuni Pueblo for healthcare workers and parents um, about healthy homes. We've also done healthy homes training for the eight northern Pueblos. And housing conditions on the Pueblos can be pretty rough sometimes. Uh, and also what we talk about has to be specific to what's going on with their housing. For example, next week we've been specifically asked to address the fact that many people at Zuni Pueblo make jewelry inside their homes and are using toxic substances without uh, you know, adequate ventilation. They also often have invented space heaters and really old unsafe appliances. And mold can be a big issue with all the accompanying health problems. And then we've, done, uh, we've worked with healthcare workers, such as the ones at Zuni next week. And we've worked in the southern part of the state with Promotoras, the Hispanic home healthcare workers. And so some of, um, here are then some of the classes that we've taught. We teach the Essentials of Healthy Homes, which is the flagship um, training for the National Center for Healthy Housing. And we've offered this regularly around the state. We have diverse students in this class, from weatherization workers to people in the healthcare, health, uh, the housing industries. And part of that class involves an exercise where students have to make connections in their community between health uh, and housing um, options and, and what's out there that can help them. And so weatherization is always one of the, the first components that, that's identified and gets talked about a lot within the whole course. We teach the Health Opportunities and Energy Audit class. And this is one we've just taught recently for a weatherization agency in the southern part of the state. And it's a short one-day class that's really informative for people working in weatherization or auditing. And then the flip side of that is the Healthy Homes for Community Workers. And that's a, a one-day class for healthcare workers. We teach the lead RRP training for, to have from uh, contractors to weatherization workers uh, all around the state. And then we also uh, do the lead safe weatherization courses. And then we've integrated the Healthy Homes course into our degree program for everyone in the trades classes at Santa Fe Community College. For example, if you are in the HVAC program and you're studying um, you know, some aspect of HVAC or, or you're in a plumbing class, uh, now taking Healthy Homes is a mandatory core component. So we decided it was really important for everyone coming out of our classes to have a core understanding of the Healthy Home principles as they're going to be working in homes. And we have students in the health department also taking this class. So the student mix in the class is really great. And then we integrate Healthy Homes, or I guess you could say brainwash Healthy Homes principles and ideas into whatever classes else we teach. And so here are some of the um, ideas that we, we do in the class, or some of the activities that we incorporate. Uh, we use the straw. I, I'm not sure whether um, you're all aware, but if you have asthma, if you, if you have never had asthma, and you get one of those little coffee stirrers and close your nose and try breathing through one of these straws, very quickly it gets uh, fairly terrifying. And um, it gives you a good feeling of what it must feel like to have asthma. So this is a real eye-opener. It's an attention grabber at the beginning of our classes. And people who don't know what it's like then get a sense. And it engages them immediately in the class. And they start to realize the importance of, of what they're doing. It's not just an, um, a concept to them anymore. Uh, we also will try to give out radon test kits if we can get them free, which, which often we can. So people can take them home and test their own houses. Um, we have a Healthy Homes, so just a checklist that we've we've put together that ask them questions about their house. And if they're in training for more than one day, we'll give this out and encourage them to take it home and use it on their house. Um, and then come back and have a discussion about what they found. So relating it back to their own help home really helps instead of it just being an intellectual exercise when they're in the training. And then we've used uh, the weatherization um, guidelines on health and safety to incorporate this into, into our trainings. And so you know, what are the benefits to us uh, of the Healthy Homes training? As a training center, we uh, regularly meet to reach a lot of markets now that may initially seem to have had no connection to weatherization. Uh, and you start to incorporate the Healthy Homes principles into a lot of your other classes. Um, it's given us a great opportunity for collaboration around the state with many different entities. And doing so has given us a better understanding of state and local issues that which has then informed our training, and it's given added benefits to people who take our training. 
There's a growing understanding around the state of, from many different industries about the importance and relevance of healthy home principles. And then many of our classes provide great networking opportunities for students, and it's also broadened their vision of their work. You know, for example, we've got HVAC professionals sitting with healthcare workers, weatherization auditors, and building code officials in the same room discussing things you know, from all their perspectives. And it's a great way to start conversations and you know, understand you know, amongst those people. So I think there's huge benefits for weatherization agencies to get involved with healthy homes, just as it's given you know, us inroads to other markets throughout the state that we may not have normally had access to. So thank you for your time. And um, I'll pass this back to Ryan. OK, thanks, Amanda. We do have one uh, question. Are you doing anything with radon testing or mitigation or working with your state radon program? We just uh, offered a radon training up in Taos for Taos Pueblo because the northern part of our state has got fairly high radon levels. Um, it's a specific training that was a five-day radon measurement and mitigation training that we had to bring in some other industry experts to teach the class for us because you need to uh, be, uh, as a, I guess, an authorized training organization to, to offer that at a specific level that we are not. But we did bring them in, and at the time we had not only Taos Pueblo uh, people take the training, but we had other people from around the state training. And then when we are doing our classes, we do address radon, um, but that is the only specific training that we've done where, where, you've managed, where people have tested out at the end of the, the training. OK, thanks. So it looks like we've come to the end of our webinar. I would like to take this time to thank all of our presenters. I'd also like to thank all of our participants on the line today. Uh, over the next few days, you will be receiving an email that, ha that will have a link to the PowerPoints as well as a link to the recorded presentation so that you can go back and view it in your spare time. Um, we hope that you will have a few minutes to respond to a questionnaire that we will be sending you regarding this webinar. Uh, our webinar series will continue next week with integrating weatherization with lead hazard control. Registration is available via the event page, which is located at www.xpluhealth.org. Uh, I would like to thank everyone on the line for joining us today, and I wish you all a good day. Thank you.